So is that speak up? Okay. Excellent. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Sarah Watson. I'm the digital mapping specialist um, here in the Science and Engineering Library. And this is the first of three workshops that I'll be leading. So hopefully you can attend all three and, and they'll kind of build upon one another. Um, today is just kind of an introduction. Um, so if you are not familiar at all with kind of mapping or GIS, hopefully you'll leave here today with a better, better um, understanding of everything. Um, and I'd like to welcome folks that are listening remotely. Um, so to begin, that's my email address. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. I'm happy to chat with you about different map projects, map ideas, um, help you sort of strategize maybe some different things that may be effective for something that you're working on. Um, so just kind of a quick overview of sort of where we're going to go and we'll kind of see what happens. We are working with different websites and different technologies. So there's always a chance that things may kind of fall apart as we're working. Um, but that is the joy of dealing with GIS, honestly. So you have to have a lot of patience if you're, if you're working with GIS. So I want to begin with just kind of talking about some different terms. It's important if you're interested in maps, if you're interested in GIS, that you kind of have a um, basic understanding of some different terminology. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about ArcGIS and QGIS. We're going to do a geocoding activity. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about map design, which I think is a really important piece, particularly for folks that are developing maps for um, projects or presentations to kind of think really critically about what, what type of design um, elements they want to include. And then finally, we're going to play around a little bit with ArcGIS Online. So to begin, what is a map, right? So this is sort of the fundamental kind of first place to begin. Um, and what you soon discover is that a map can be a lot of different things. There's a lot of competing definitions. If you sort of boil it down to its kind of um, smallest parts, you can think of a map as a spatial representation of reality, right? You're attempting to depict something that exists in the world. Um, why are maps useful? Uh, they simplify and make reality easier to understand, right? You're attempting to kind of take something very complex, put it into a visual representation, and hopefully convey um, something effectively and simply. Oftentimes, less is more, right? So when you think about maps, you want to think about boiling things down. Um, they can help us see new realities, right? If we haven't been to a place, if we haven't thought of um, something in that way, maps can be useful for, the, for that. Um, and they can oftentimes show us things that we can't easily see, right? Something like the temperature. That's not something we can easily um, visualize. We can perhaps feel it, but a weather map is really effective, right, for looking at and, and seeing what the temperature is outside or someplace else. So maps um, have, a, uh, have a lot of different uses. So you can see um, in 1996, a scholar actually attempted to co compile um, all the different definitions of maps that he could find. Um, he came up with 321 different definitions. And so after he uh, compiled this and sort of edited things down, you can eventually make uh, a word cloud that kind of shows you what some of the similarities between these definitions are, right? And again, this is attempting to kind of think about something that Perhaps intuitively we think we know what a map is, but when we sort of take a step back and, start, and actually attempt to articulate it, we can sometimes get lost, right? And, and suddenly a map isn't as easy to define as we think it might have been. But there are some similarities between these def different definitions, right? Representation, surface, earth. So, so again, right, we're kind of going back to this idea that it's a spatial representation of reality. Um, so again, right, a map should have a narrative. Um, it's, you're attempting to sort of frame information for the viewer. Um, you want to think about how you're depicting things, what is sort of cause and effect. And maps can actively construct new knowledges, right? They can help us sort of think differently about the world. Maps have power, right? Even something as simple as sort of a road map. There's choices being made, right? And what is depicted and what not is depicted. And so as a map maker, you have to constantly be thinking about your sort of situated power, right? And how you're, the choices you're making play into the representations you're creating. Um, and then we get into these sort of questions, right? Of what counts as data? What, when we're, what, what are we choosing to include and what are we choosing not to include? 
and then sort of effective design, right? So the different images, the different symbols, um, how do those play into the narrative we're attempting to create? So that's kind of the idea of maps, right? This sort of big thing. They can be, they can take many different forms, right? Some scholars argue that that something like an oral history, right, could be could be a map, right? That there's sort of you're you're depicting uh, a spatial reality verbally. How is that really any different than if you're drawing a map, right? So there's sort of competing understandings um, that we need to kind of remain conscious of. But then we get into the kind of world of GIS. Um, and so GIS is Geographic Information System. Um, is there a way that this can go away? OK. OK. Oh. Yeah, that's, yeah, that should be. OK, great, thank you. Unpause. Yeah, OK. All righty. Take two. All right, so we can think of GIS, right, as a geographic information system. So it kind of, again, is a set of tools that captures, stores, analyzes, manages, and presents data that are linked to a location. So it's a pretty big thing, right? So it's a lot of different pieces. It's technology, it's the individual, it's the data, all kind of coming together in the production of uh, geographic information. So this is then tied to sort of spatial or data analysis. So the study of spatial visualizations of patterns, properties, and relationships. So this idea of relationships is really important when we think about GIS, right? Um, how, how are things related to one another? And then how do you depict those relationships? Um, and so these two pieces, right, bleed back into sort of our conversation about what is a map, right? And this is sort of the new frontier in some ways of uh, cartography and GIS and sort of geospatial data is the kind of phenomenon of GIS. Um, there we go. So then we can start thinking about what does a map look like? What features appear on a map? Um, and this is important to note because there's, there's a standardization process, right, behind this that we kind of have to think about before we can start creating our own visualizations. So we can think about map features. And these are things, right, that may, again, seem very common sense to you. But when you actually start making maps, you oftentimes will very quickly forget these things even exist. Um, so something like a title, something like scale, explanatory text, does your map need um, a kind of info box included that provides additional details so it can be understood, um, a legend, orientation. Does the, will the map reader immediately know which way is north on the map? Is north at the top of the page or is it someplace else? Um, a border, you may not think that, but oftentimes a border really helps convey information or it helps the, um, the map reader understand the um, information more clearly. Is there a date, sources and credits? Is there a locator map that is in included as well? So you can think a little bit about th those different features with this example, right? So we have explanatory text. Um, we have a title. We have the locator map that's sort of showing you exactly where this zoomed in piece is situated um, globally. We have source. Um, so these are the different features, right, that you want to think about as you're actually kind of creating something of kind of more professional quality. Another example, um, we can see, right, the kind of indicator for north, the scale bar. Um, the explanatory text again, a legend, a title. These different features um, are necessary to kind of create a map that fits kind of the conventional map making standards. Right, and a topo map is kind of another really classic example of, of a kind of um, map that features most of the conventions, right? You have this nice border that really enables you to kind of more easily see the details of the map. You don't have stuff bleeding off the page. You have the scale bar, you have a date, you have um, the title, all these different features, right? And I, I suggest all of this information to you, right? Not only to show it to you, but also to say you have to kind of know it to then break the rules, right? There's a lot of maps that do not fit these conventions, but 
those maps are effective, I would argue, because the people who made it kind of know what rules they're breaking. They're not just sort of haphazardly assembling something, but instead they're sort of consciously saying, well, my map is not going to have a title. My map is not going to um, adhere to some of the conventions, but instead it's going to do something else. And hopefully there's a purpose right behind why you're choosing not to follow those map conventions. And so you can see here just one more example of the north indicator. So this has sort of fallen um, out of FAD as something you have to include on a map since most maps north is up. And that's kind of the convention that we're accustomed to. So you will sort of see that not included unless north is not directly up, but instead is pointing off to one of the other um, angles. So next, I want to just kind of talk a little bit about some different map features and kind of terminology. Again, if you sort of want to get into map production, map making, you kind of have to know this stuff because it comes into play repeatedly. Um, so the first is latitude and longitude. Um, so these are the kind of imaginary lines. Okay. <laughs> So these are the kind of imaginary lines, right, that we use to um, create a grid to help us pinpoint locations, right? So again, if you're attempting to sort of take the earth and make it understandable, um, geographically understandable, latitude and longitude are really useful for finding places and understanding locations on a map. Scale, so this is another big one, right? Um, so when you're thinking about scale, you're thinking about how has the image been um, produced in a way to sort of mimic or replicate um, the, uh, the real world, right? So one inch on the map equals X miles in uh, the real world. And so this can be expressed in different ways on a map. You can see kind of a verbal expression where it will just be written as one, e one inch equals a thousand miles. You can have a visual where you have a bar line, um, and then you have a representative fraction that um, begins with the first number as one as a unit of me measurement then for sort of the comparison. Um, so this is important, right, because if you're particularly using maps for kind of directional purposes or actually to get from point A to point B, you kind of need to understand, right, how big um, the information is on the map relative to the real world, right? So this is another feature that we need to kind of think about. Um, when you're working in something like ArcGIS, you're always kind of messing with the different scales to kind of determine what size your image should be to most effectively convey information. And the thing that's tricky with scale is that the terms large scale and small scale um, can be confusing. So you may think, large scale means the largest number here at the end, but it does not. So this is sort of where things can be sometimes confusing when you're talking about scale on maps. So you wanna think about a large scale map as showing the most, the features at their largest. So it's the most zoomed in um, of the images available, whereas a small scale map is the most zoomed out. So this is something that you can kind of get tripped up with when you're kind of working in a program and you kind of attempt to adjust the scale and you think you're zooming in, but then you actually see that it has zoomed out because you sort of mixed up large scale and small scale. So this is just something to kind of be aware of as you're uh, working through a program. And then we get into the fun world of map projections. Um, so I actually wanna show you a little bit of a video clip because I think it helps, helps um, depict through visuals more effectively than me attempting to explain. So let's hope that this works. Will audio play? All right. Okay, that's fine. Um, so the main purpose in showing this to you all was, was for the visualization more than the audio. So let's hope. So you see he has an orange that's supposed to represent the globe. And so he's talking about how do you take a three-dimensional um, 
item, like an orange or the globe, and how do you reduce that to two dimensions, which is what map projections is about. And so as he shows you there, right, you can peel an orange and you have this big piece, but when you tap to flatten it, you can't really do it effectively, right? Something's going to look weird when you do that. And so this is, I think, a nice visualization for what's going on when we're working with map projections, is you're taking the circular globe and you're trying to figure out how do we take this three-dimensional item and make it 2D without losing critical information. And it turns out you can't. So this is, becomes one of the kind of challenges in the nego negotiations you're making as um, someone working with maps. So since we can't hear it, we'll just move away. All right, so you can see, right, that a map projection is the systematic transformation of the latitudes and longitudes of locations on the surface of a sphere, the Earth, into locations on a plane, so 3D to 2D. Um, they're absolutely necessary. It's really difficult to make a effective map that is um, depicting a spatial representation without using a map projection. And what you find out is all map projections distort, that that's just the nature of the game, is when you sort of smash the orange peel down, something's going to kind of get messed up. And so your power as a map maker is to, is to decide which features are, am I okay with having messed up. And so this gets into certain conversations, again, about power, about representation, what are we most comfortable having look weird? So everyone has probably seen this, this is probably the type of map that was in your elementary school um, classroom. It's the Mercator projection. It's easily the most famous map projection that exists. And it looks fine, right? It looks how we think things should look, right? But what we can see is if we just jump ahead to um, the Gail Peters projection, it looks very different, right? We go. So perhaps the thing that stands out most to you is su suddenly Africa looks very different between these two different projections. And so this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about distortion. The size, the shape, the area of different places change based on the map projection that you choose. So if you're making a map um, of Africa, you might want to pick something that looks more like this if you want something that's more accurate in representational size. If you're focusing on a different place, perhaps this isn't the appropriate map projection. And so this is kind of the conversation you have to have internally as someone creating maps. Um, and this again sort of highlights the kind of controversy of map making, right? Because this is entrenched in power dynamic conversations, right? There's been many arguments made that this is sort of perpetuating a kind of colonial mindset because it's situating Africa as spatially smaller than even Greenland. And so it helps for the kind of um, geographic imaginary that, that depicts Africa as somehow inferior or less than uh, the West. And then suddenly that becomes slightly more difficult to do when Africa is, give, is depicted in its true represent, representative size. So th there's thousands of map projections. Every kind of sassy person who knows the technology has made a map projection. So if you look online, you can find multitudes that you can select from. You can kind of play around with which one makes the most sense. You would want to take into considerations of scale, right? So if you're focusing on Lexington, Kentucky, you know, the map projection perhaps is not going to matter as much than if you're focusing on the entire world. So those sort of conversations you have to have. Um, one thing that you'll, if you stick around for the web mapping uh, um, workshop, we'll discover that you're sort of bounded by the conventions of different software online that default to certain projections. So then you have difficulty really playing around with things because the default has been set for you. So these are, you know, the different things we have to think about. And then just one more map projection. So this is the current standard that's used by National Geographic Society. So if any of you have young kids, this might be the map that is shown in their elementary schools. Um, this is supposed to kind of most um, easily represent things without um, the same degree of distortion that you even see with something like this. So these are just a sample of different map projections. 
And so then we kind of have this background of information now, right? We've talked about longitude, latitude, scale, map projections. And so then we can kind of start thinking a little bit about GIS file formats. So this is sort of getting into the actual, all right, you've given me this random terminology. How do I actually start creating a map? Um, and it's important to know that there's kind of two main file formats that you're going to have to work with, the first being vector. So this is sort of the geographical features. Um, so this would be points, lines, polygons. Um, you can see just in this little image here to the side, this is all vector information with the points, the lines, and then the polygon of the water. Um, and so the most popular file format that you'll deal with is called a shape file. So this was actually created by Esri, um, who we'll talk about here in a little bit. So you cannot avoid shape files. This is going to kind of be the main um, vector format that you'll be working with as you um, mess around with kind of GIS. There's also Tiger and then there's KML. Um, if you do anything in Google Earth, you're probably going to deal with KML a decent amount. Um, and so then the second type of file format is a raster file. So pr most of you are probably familiar with a raster file if you kind of work with digital photography at all. So it's, it's kind of the pixel form of, the, of an image. Um, so this is something like kind of digital, aer digital aerial uh, photographs, scanned maps. Um, so part of what I've been doing is scanning various maps. These are all uh, raster images. And these can be saved in, a, in a, you know, many different file formats, with some of the most common being a GeoTIFF, a JPEG 2000, um, and then a digital raster uh, graphic. So as you begin assembling different maps, you're going to kind of be switching between these different file formats a good chunk of the time. Um, and so then we can kind of think a little bit about map data. So there's kind of two categories for that with there being discrete. So this is kind of data at fixed locations, buildings, roads, trees, um, things like that, right? These are things that are kind of locked in a spatial location. And this is typically then going to be depicted with the vector um, uh, file format, right? So points, lines, polygons, things like that. And then we also have continuous data. Um, this does not have as well-defined boundaries. Sometimes that has no boundaries. Um, so this would be like a weather map. So sort of you see that kind of progression from 50 degrees to 60 degrees to you know 80 degrees. Um, elevation on a topo map that's just kind of um, continuously shifting um, its uh, size as you study the different uh, areas of the map. And so that's kind of... Um, the kind of quick and dirty of kind of different map data and kind of file formats. As we kind of continue with our workshops, we'll kind of go back and sort of talk a little bit more about those. So we can then begin thinking a little bit about making maps, right? This is why you're all here. Um, the first piece of information I would give you is don't reinvent the wheel, right? So it's always a good idea to look around online to maybe see if the map you want has already been made and is free to use. This is particularly um, important to do if, you're, if you want to do anything with census data. Um, the census has been pretty good about producing different maps. So if you're doing a project on something like um, you know, uh, uh, wealth or, or income or population, you may want to look at the census website for the different maps that they've made. You can look at thematic maps. So some of these have actually already been made for you. So if we just kind of click on the first example here, it looks really nice, right? So again, rather than spending a lot of time cursing under your breath as you attempt to make a map, it's always useful to just kind of look around online and see if someone has already done the labor for you. You can um, appropriately cite them put it into your, your project and kind of move on down the road. Um, so this is one example from the census that are these kind of pre-made maps. Um, another example is, see if it'll open for us, is a little bit more hands-on. So this kind of allows you to sort of play with the features a little bit more. Okay. 
Right, so you have the kind of ability here to the side to p select different features, to select uh, kind of different data. You can change a color. Um, and then you can kind of choose the classification type. You can choose the number of classes. So this is something I would recommend, right, that if you're sort of thinking about a project, you may want to kind of spend a little bit of time looking online to kind of see what um, hidden kind of programs or, or, or websites you can find that kind of show you things. This allows you to save to a PDF. So again, if you're kind of putting something into a report or into a PowerPoint, this type of thing can be very nice. Um, so I offer these to you as just the kind of um, tip of the iceberg of these types of things that you can find if you look online. But I suspect most of you are like, that's fine, but I came here to learn how to make a map, not have you tell me that there's websites that exist that have made maps for me. Um, so we're kind of getting to that chunk of things. So first, I want to just talk a little bit about two, the two biggest platforms, desktop platforms or your computer that exist to actually make maps. If you stick around for the next workshop, we'll be playing around with these. Um, there's been some technology issues, so we weren't able to do that today. But the first is Esri. So this is the um, big dog of kind of map production, um, of map commercialization. Um, they oversee the various ArcGIS products. So there's different products that they, they produce. The two most common being ArcGIS Online, which is a cloud-based mapping platform, and then ArcMap, which is the desktop uh, platform. And they both kind of have different features, but this is the standard. I mean, if you're going into any career and kind of geospatial data, then you're going to have to confront Arc. We do have the ability here at UK to have ARC, to um, get access to ARC for free. You have to contact the UK, UKY GIS campus support. They have different kind of restrictions based on if you're a student or a faculty or staff person. So you'll have to kind of look through the different um, restrictions and then submit a request or have someone, depending on your status, submit the request for you. And then you can get it onto a desktop. And there's limits to how long the license lasts, depending on if you're a student or a staff person. Um, but it's free. So if you kind of want to play around with it, then you should, certainly should access it. And so the challenge to Esri has been QGIS. And so a lot of folks, right, don't like the fact that it's really expensive to get access to Esri. If you're not affiliated with a university, it's probably going to be above what you're willing to pay. So folks have spent a lot of time developing an alternative and the most kind of popular has been QGIS. So this is free, it's open source, um, it works with Windows Mac um, computers, whereas Arc only works with Windows. So depending on um, the type of computer you have, the types of needs you have, QGIS is a really nice alternative. Um, it doesn't have the same um, professional oversight. So sometimes there can be kind of glitches and then it can take a little while for those glitches to be fixed. So you kind of, it's a give and take, you have to weigh the pros and cons, but they have a very similar um, style desktop kind of format. So if you play around in QGIS and then suddenly transfer over to ARC, you should be able to do that pretty comfortably. So if you don't want to spend the money on ARC or if you, for whatever reason, don't want to go through the university, you can learn a lot just kind of playing with Q that then can be translated to ARC. And this is just, you know, ideally we would have these opened on our computers, but this is what it looks like when you first log into ARC. So you can just see, right, um, it's a pretty basic format. You have the kind of data frame, the data box. You have the kind of table of contents, and this is where all your data will appear. So the different layers that you're adding. So if you have a base map, if you then have um, information about kind of county uh, income levels, all that kind of stuff appears here at the side. You have the different um, view options down here at the bottom. You have the kind of main menu. Um, you have sort of toolbar information. So this is what it looks like when you initially open it. And then you have the fun of trying to figure out what do all the icons mean. Um, and sometimes these icons disappear for no reason. So it is patience is a virtue as you sort of start playing around in this type of program. So this is what we'll kind of focus on in the next workshop. 
But for now, I actually kind of want us to kind of play around a little bit with creating data that is mappable. Um, and to do that, I want us to focus a little bit on what's called geocoding. So does anyone know the longitude and latitude of your home address? Right? So we don't think in those terms, right? When we think about space, as we maneuver through space, we don't think about it in terms of longitude, latitude, right? But that's usually really important when we start mapping information. So ge geocoding is the process of converting an address into geographic coordinates. Um, so there's different ways to do this. Uh, it kind of depends on how many addresses you need to convert. So you'll sometimes see the terminology geosearch used, and this is when you're just converting one address. Batch geocoding refers to converting many. Um, and then there's even something called reverse geocoding. So this is if you have the longitude and latitude, but you're trying to figure out the address. So then you can try to reverse engine your way back to the address location. And so what you end up doing for just the kind of basic geocoding is you have an address, you standardize it, right? So this is when you want to make sure that you have avenue is AVE and not something else, that type of stuff. You want to make sure you're sort of meeting kind of um, conventions of addresses. You then have coordinates produced, and then you ideally can put these on a map. Um, so, did everyone look at their emails? If you haven't, you should log into your um, email. Ideally, you should have a Google Drive link that I have shared with you. Okay. So if you open that up, hopefully it looks something like this. And so this is just sort of a sample that I, I kind of made for us to kind of walk through. And so if you download the first piece here, that's the, the Lex bars, you should get something that looks like this. Just the Lex bars. I think it's just the first one. So you see the name, the address, and you can see the address is broken into address, city, state, and then zip code. Um, and so this is sort of the bare minimum that you then need. So theoretically, right, you could have a thousand addresses that you're attempting to use. For our purposes, we're going to kind of start here with the first one. So these are just various bars, right, located around Lexington. These are some of the popular ones that are, that are found on Yelp. Um, so you have this. So the next thing you want to do, so if I can open up a new tab, okay, is you actually want to go to the Batch Geo website. And so you also will probably need to save the uh, Lex bars to some place that you can find it if you if you don't know where it downloaded into. It's important to note that you'll you need to do this in CSV. So if you just have it saved in some other format, it probably is not going to work typically. So when you're doing this type of thing. Uh, CSV is going to be the necessary file format. So is everyone at Batch Geo? Okay, we'll wait another, wait another second here. Okay. So, assuming that you can pull up the saved file, <laughs> as 
see me I can. You should just be able to drag it into, well, theoretically, you should be able to drag it into Okay, so if you can't drag it, the other option is just to open up and copy the information and then paste it. So hopefully it looks something like that. So then you can validate and set options. And so this kind of defaults to kind of the basic address city state. So you typically don't have to mess around with that. And then you can click make a map. Oh yeah. Okay, awesome. So theoretically what you can then do is you can save it. This does require you to give require you to give them your email address, so if you have issues with that, you can choose not to. Um, and then once you save the map, it actually emails you it. So then you can access the link, you can kind of edit things if you want to, and kind of play around with the different features. Once you have it saved and you open it back up through your email, you have the option to download it as um, a KMX file, which is then able to be opened in Google Earth. These computers do not have Google Earth on them. So what I have done, if you then look at the Dropbox, you can see that to make these um, readable, uh, for our purposes, I converted them to a KML file, right? So this was what I mentioned earl earlier, one of the really kind of common files that you'll see. So, assuming this continues to work for everyone, I'm going to suggest that we actually import this information into Google Maps, and we can then make a custom Google Map. Um, this is a nice entry point if you're working on a project, you kind of want to make something quickly. Um, you want to make something that gives you a decent amount of options, you kind of can't beat Google Maps. Uh, there are some size limitations, so depending on how much data you have, you may run up against that issue. But if you're kind of just making something for a presentation, uh, you probably will be fine in, in Google. So everyone has a Google account, right? I realize that uh, if not, you can follow along with what I'm doing up here. So. What you want to do is, the simplest thing is probably just to Google, Google custom maps. You'll probably, hopefully be given the kind of first option to kind of create your own map. You need to be logged into your Google account for this to work, so it is tied to your Google account. You can see the various test mistake maps I've crafted. Um, so has everyone managed to get to this point? No? Okay, well wait a second. Are there any questions from anyone watching remotely, Robert? Okay. Yes, yeah. So you can actually import it from your Google Drive, so I guess you don't have to download it. So when you are in Google Maps, you wanna click custom map or create a map, create a new map here at the top. Should get something that looks like this. And you can even see that it's sort of mimicking the, the layout of ArcGIS, right? Where you have the kind of data box here where your, your map shows up, you have here to the side your table of contents that dip depicts where your, your different layers. So they all kind of follow a similar format um, for the most part. So has everyone gotten to this stage? Okay.
big news to come out of this person. Yeah. It wouldn't. So I was wearing the very top right and the little option. Yeah, right there. And then so we can even we can just save it. I would save it. Save that as. Save it wherever you want to. How did you get to do it? Can you add custom? So that's an important thing to note. So an important thing to note is Google Maps is different than Google Custom Maps. So if you're just getting directions, right, Google Maps is where you're going to go. But if you're making a map, you need to make sure you get to the custom page. So the next thing is to add data, right, to the map. It's all well and good until we realize we need to add data. So you can either upload the KML file if you downloaded it. Because I shared it with you with Google, you should be able to access it in Google Drive. Maybe not. It looks like you may have to download it. I'm not sure why it wasn't appearing as an option from the Google Drive. Maybe. So has, it, has anyone gotten it actually to upload so it looks something like this? No? Yes? Okay. It's working. Okay. So what, what does it look like when it works? Thank 
So theoretically, if this worked, you then end up with something that looks like this, right? That shows, if you zoom in, it should hopefully have placed a point icon above all your different data points. So it looks something like this, right? And then you can begin to customize it, right? So you can kind of play around with the different symbol colors. So when you click on each one, you can then say, well, I actually want this to be a different color. I click on. <laughs> you can change it to whatever symbol you want it to be. And so again, right, if you're sort of making something for a project, this is a nice way to kind of jump into GIS without needing some of the technical background to really get into the nitty gritty. Um, and so then, theoretically, you can add more layers. So right, if you have different layers you want to add, you can continue to do that. Um, in the interest of time, we may not kind of bother with that, but you can continue to import different files. You can then play around with the base map. So that's a nice feature too with, with the custom, is you can kind of pick the base map that most complements the type of uh, data that you have. So right, you have a decent amount of flexibility. Um, for folks that have been able to download this KML file, I actually would like you to just spend a couple of minutes thinking about the design element. So what icon would do you think best suits um, different bars in Lexington? What color, right? So you, if you're attempting to effectively communicate information, what choices would you make? Would you have a different icon for each of the bars? Would you uh, have a different color? Would you have them be all the same color? What would be some of the different <laughs> map design, design decisions you would make? You can also change the layer title. So perhaps Lexington dash bars is not what you want it to be. You can call it something else. You can title your map, right? So we get back into the kind of map standards, the map conventions, the different things that most maps have. So you probably don't want to have your map be called untitled map. So these are the different things, right, you would be thinking about as you kind of create your custom map. Right, so just as, as a, um, to, as a reminder, when you download the batch of geo, information you it comes as a kml file or i'm sorry a kmx file that you then upload to google earth so the google earth is the easiest way to like it is yeah to convert you because you can just open it in that and then just save it as a kml and then the kml is readable by most programs and so like qgis can read it this can read it and then you can upload it into that <laughs> okay, excellent. And so you, if you look back at the <laughs> folder I shared with you, you can see that there's other files in there. So if you want to kind of play around with this a little bit more, there's a CSV file for coffee shops, there's a CSV file for, for donut shops. So you can kind of explore Lexington via those different data sets and see if it works. And if it doesn't, you can always contact me as well. So if you are playing around a little bit with this, and for some reason, the whatever file just will not work, you can shoot me an email and we can try to troubleshoot what the issue is. Um, 
So then I kind of want to have a little bit of a conversation about the different design, design decisions you made. So um, what, how many of you kept the standard little uh, point icon? Did anyone keep that? Okay. What did you change your icon to? Does anyone want to share? Yeah, go ahead. Martini glass. Okay, classic. Yeah, martini glass. All right. Did, uh, did you guys keep all your martini glasses the same color or did you differentiate? Was there, did you, was there a reason why you changed? Like, was a pattern? Okay, just color. Okay, so you just sort of randomly selected different colors. Okay, how about, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but yeah, yeah. Hi. Okay, okay, excellent. Okay, so we have two martini glasses. How about other folks? What, who, who picked something really absurd or crazy? Anyone? Yeah, Robert. Okay, monster. Was there, was there a reason behind that? Yeah, you just saw that and you were like, that speaks to me? Okay. Did you keep your monster icons all the same color? Okay, is there a reason why you did that? Okay, you just did. Right, sure. Awesome. So then, let's see. So we then get into the question, right, of design and um, how do we make effective choices, right, to most easily convey our information. So if we had had some more time to kind of play around with this. This was a sample that I, I made with the three different data sets, right? So this is the coffee shops, this is the bars, and this is the donut shops. Um, I don't know why it has that weird blue background. Hold on. Oh, I know what I did. Okay. You can also embed these maps and you can share them. So this is another feature as well. So if you're doing like an online project, you can embed this map into your project. Um, so I worked with uh, Sue Smith to embed one into a libguide. So you can kind of play around with that depending on what you're doing. Um, you just have to, again, have patience because probably the first time it's not going to work. And so you just got to keep playing with it. But if you sort of make a map with different data sets, you can kind of get something that looks like this, right? So you can see, um, one of the issues is that it sometimes your title is too long. So pick your vice, caffeine, booze, and sugar in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, and then you can look through the different data sets, right? So for coffee shops, I chose a coffee cup, right? There, and this, again, is if someone is just looking at that icon, can they guess what it's supposed to represent? It's sort of a good rule of thumb, right? So the monster for the bar might take a little more explaining than the martini glass. Maybe you want to have to um, have that degree of explanation, but maybe you don't, right? So you're always sort of gauging uh, or making decisions about what is most effective. For bars, so I actually differentiated between two types. I put a beer glass for ones that most serve beer and then the martini glass for all the other ones. But you note, I kept them all the same color. So they're still connected in their, their symbology and the color, but they're differentiated. So this is another feature, right, with map design, where if you have data that is similar yet different, how do you connect it yet differentiate? And something like keeping the same color, but having a different symbol is a really productive way to do that. And then the last one for donut shops, Google didn't really provide me an icon that I liked, right? So I, there was nothing there that I thought most conveyed a donut shop. So what I did is I actually chose the custom icon and just found a free clip art donut that I imported to use that as a symbol. So you have different options again, right, with the kind of customization where you can kind of just pick a standard, you can 
um, import, you can import photos. So if you want to play around with your smiling face as, as the, the symbol, you can do that. Um, you can also, if you go back to the edit page, you can add photos. So this again, if you're um, working on a project, you may have some really nice photos of the different locations that you would like to include. This would be most for an online presentation, right? It's not going to work if you're attempting to then print this. And then if you are working in the edit page, a couple more things to point out here when you click the three dots is this is where you go to embed, this is where you go um, to copy it, and this is where you also go to print. So you do have the ability to print what you're making in the Google Map and, and incorporate it into some sort of uh, paper project. Are there any questions about kind of uh, working with Google custom maps? It's relatively intuitive once you start playing around with it. Um, but like I said, I think it's a nice example of how you can kind of produce something without needing um, a really big learning curve. Um, the other thing I want to point out to you that's really nice um, with Google, <coughs> let's see here. Um, So you can search for things, but if you view it then in just basic Google Maps, so this is not the custom, but this is just basic Google Maps. If you right click on any location and then do the what's here, it actually will give you the coordinates down here at the bottom. So this is just if you are just working and you only need a couple you aren't really kind of messing with a bunch of multiple files. This is probably the most straightforward way to just go and quickly get that information is just to go to basic Google Maps, find your location, right click, and then use the what's here and it very nicely will tell you. So um, as you kind of play around with any probably GIS format or platform, you're going to probably find yourself going back to Google Maps in different ways. Okay. So this is just a little bit of a breakdown of some of the, the um, map communication elements. So these are just, again, things that we've sort of discussed a little bit with the geocoding activity, but I do wanna just kind of reiterate. So when you're dealing with map communication, you're kind of dealing with both an intellectual hierarchy, um, what is the sort of relative importance of all the information to your message, to your communication, and then you're dealing with a visual hierarchy, right? How do you best visually represent the different information? And this is something, right, that we can kind of gloss over, but map, the effectiveness of your map is going to depend on how good your map design is, right? You can have all the best information in the world, but if you have a cluttered, kind of over the top map, it's not going to do what you want it to do. So we kind of have to think a lot about what we want with our different map design. So some of the things you may want to consider is obviously your audience, right? Are they experts? Are they novices? How will the map be displayed? Is it going to be in black and white? Is it going to be on a PowerPoint slide? Is it going to be in a report? Um, and then you probably want to play around with, is it actually going to be legible in that format? If you convert a color map to black and white because of you know, printing costs or whatever, it's probably not going to look as, as good as if you could keep it in color. So these are the different things you kind of have to think about. So when you think about visual hierarchy, we'll move through this pretty quickly, um, right? You're kind of thinking about figure ground stuff. So what piece of information should stand out the most? How do you use color to effectively show that? And this, these images are taken from um, Krieger and Woods Making Maps book. So if you are interested in map design, I strongly suggest you purchase or uh, check out from the library their book. So this is visual arrangements. So thinking about the balance, right? How not putting so much at the top that then it's kind of uh, weighted weirdly. And this is sort of intuitive. This is sort of, again, the decisions you make as a, as a map maker. But 
it's something you have to think about, right? Because we have a tendency to perhaps just to kind of produce and not then take a step back and say, well, is this um, effectively communicating? Right, symbolization. So everything on the map is a symbol. Um, the map symbols are tied to the data. So this is the choices you have to then make. Um, if you're working with qualitative data or quantitative data, you have to kind of think about the different map symbols. Right, so there's different ways to do this, right? There can be resemblance, um, where the different symbols resemble one another that are connected. Um, we can think about uh, symbols by relationship. Um, small symbol means small size, the larger symbol means larger size, right? Things like that. Um, and then symbol by convention, right? You probably don't want to use the um, kind of church symbol for the bar, right? That's not going to really communicate probably what you want. So there's certain conventions, there's certain kind of standards that you can kind of look up for what some symbols typically mean, um, right? The kind of classic one would be if you see the icon that kind of looks like what we all think of as a home, right? We all kind of know what that is, but how do you know what that is, right? I mean, it's just a kind of a box with like a triangle on the top, right? But we have sort of conventions that we're accustomed to that convey certain information. So when you're sort of making your map, you don't want to mistakenly pick something like that that's just going to kind of mis mislead the map viewer. Right, we can think about enhancing visual difference. <laughs> so different things like edges and texture and kind of proximity. Um, these are things that we'll continue to think a little bit about in, in the next workshops. Visual hierarchy, right? You probably don't want something that looks like this, where you can't really differentiate between things. Um, you want the kind of important stuff up front, right, and the other stuff to kind of fade to the back. You don't want your base map to be the most visible thing on your map, right? You want it to effectively be the base map, right? Again, we can think about sort of visual hierarchy and difference. This goes back to kind of figure ground. Is what you're depicting um, showing up effectively? Right, do you have defined features? Have you de-emphasized the background? Do you have proper layering, right? So you actually can have the top image on the top and not have it behind other things. And then we get to the question of color. Does your map need to be in color, right? Maybe not. Sometimes gray scale is more effective than color. So you have to kind of think a little bit about that. I suggest using color sparingly. It can be a temptation, right, to really just kind of make every icon a different color, the most sort of wacky, aggressive one you can find. But probably in doing so, your map is going to lose its effectiveness. Um, the other thing to think about is that some colors um, have certain conventions tied to them. So typically blue conveys water, right? So if you make a map that conveys water with a different color, make sure you're doing that for a reason, right? That kind of gets back to, you, you can break the rules, but you kind of have to know that you're doing that. Yellow, not really sure why that's not showing up as, as a nice yellow color, um, is used for built up or kind of urban areas and then green is for parks and things like that. Oops, it shows up twice. And so this again is just kind of an example of what we were messing around with, where you can kind of see some of the limitations, right? If you um, kind of leave everything or have everything be an icon that perhaps doesn't most effectively, should a coffee shop be conveyed with the kind of knife and fork? Probably not. Um, so the final thing, it heard me say final, um, is that, I actually would like everyone to make an ArcGIS online account. So this is free, up to um, two gigabytes. If you really start exploring this, you can um, get free access from the UK GIS facilities folks. The issue with that is they have an enterprise subscription. So that means all of the information you share on there is going to be viewable by anyone else who has that enterprise subscription. So if you're working with data that you theoretically don't want other people um, to tap into, you may not want the enterprise subscription. Uh, but if it, this is something that you find really productive, it's a nice way to get around the cost issues is to just go to the UKY facilities. So if you go to ARC 
GIS online. Sign myself out. Sign in. You should be able um, to create what's called a public account. You can use Facebook if that's uh, how you share information. Um, otherwise, you can kind of set up an account here. All right, so after you have created your account, if you could log in. And you should see a screen that kind of looks like this with your name up at the top. Does anyone have any issues? Okay. So then just the kind of overview, my content is, is where you typically are going to want to go to then actually be able to create things. So you should see something that looks like this. You can then add and share information. So when you click create, you can have options. You can create what's called an app, um, but for our purposes, we wanna look at the map. And so you're always going to have to give the project a title. You can always change this, you can edit it, you can put, you know, test, whatever, whatever in there if you just want a placeholder because you're kind of playing around with different things. But you do have to have a title and you do have to include tags. Um, and then you can enter a summary if you want to as well. So if we just put test um, and then just geo as a quick tag. You should have something that defaults to this. Has everyone seen this page? Right, and again, this very much mimics the arc map um, layout that I showed with you, shared with you earlier right in the image, where you have the data frame that shows your map, you have over here kind of your table of contents, and then you have different features here at the top. Um, we don't have a ton of time, but we can kind of play around a little bit with this. And so, you can see here to the side, you can always rename things. Um, you can change your base map. This is again really nice, right? It gives you a decent number of options, depending again on what you're attempting to communicate. You can select things like the kind of topo map, the kind of uh, dark gray kind of option, National Geographic. So again, it kind of depends on what you're focused on. And then the thing I want to share with you is you can add files, right? So you can add layers from your own files. It shows you the conventions here. So shapefile, like I mentioned er earlier, is the raster um, file. So if you are, are working with sort of the Esri shape files, you can upload them. You can upload our good friend, the CSV file. Um, and then you can upload the, the GPX files. Another thing you can do though, that's really nice with the ARC online is you can search for files. So these are files that other people have uploaded that you can then add to your map. So this is a nice feature. Again, if you are working on a specific project, you probably want to kind of look through what your options are here. If you want to add the file created by Esri that's US counties, 
you can search. I just entered since this, it's the third option. You hit add. <laughs> and then it overlays on your base map, right? And so this is again, a nice introduction to sort of playing around with adding layers and kind of um, manipulating layers on a map. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it probably would be a shape file or, or a CSV file. So the shape file is like the Esri raster uh, GIS. It should. Yeah, it will. You, you'll need to have the longitude and latitude typically on, in the CSV file already um, for it to recognize it and put those place marks. You then will always want to double check because sometimes things can get a little off. So you may think you have the correct longitude, latitude, but it's actually, you know, half a house down. So you always want to double check that type of data to make sure it's actually putting the point over the exact location you want. Um, and then, so you have a data layer. And then when you look over in the contents file, you can see when you scan, you're given different options. And so you can then begin manipulating manipulating the information. So you can choose which attribute you want to show. You can then change the colors. Um, you can change transparency, right? So if you're adding a bunch of different layers, you may want to adjust something like that. You can adjust the visibility. So you're given um, a, a, you know, pretty long reigns to kind of do different things with this. Again, you can print what you make. So that's a nice feature. You can share, you can embed. Um, you can do a lot of different things with the kind of online access. But are there any kind of questions about getting, logging into this? Okay. And like I said, if you have in the public free account, I think it's up to two gigabytes for free. Um, if you find that you're needing more than that, you should reach out to the facilities folks here. Um, they will then be able to give you, theoretically, they, they can then give you the enterprise access. Probably not if you're a student because of certain restrictions. So that's one of the limitations. But if you're a staff or a faculty member, you should be able to get into the, uh, be given access to the enterprise. So it depends um, how many layers you're adding. I mean, in my, you can see um, in my content. You know, I have several different maps and I'm still at 0%. So you can, you know, you're, you should be fine. It's really if you're kind of crunching a lot of data and then producing a lot of different maps, you may kind of eat through that pretty quickly. But if you're just kind of have, you know, a couple different data, uh, different layer sets, and you're sort of just making one project, one map for one project, then you should have no issue with, well, yeah. And then once you're done, you can delete and just kind of like tweak it. So there is a um, decent amount of ability to do that. Okay. So I realized that I think, okay, just a little jump here. So are there any final questions about anything? I know I kind of threw a lot of different information out at you. Um, like I said, if you stick around for the next couple workshops, we'll kind of be referencing this stuff again and so we can kind of continue to build. That's one of the reasons Christy and I kind of worked on having them pretty close together. So hopefully you don't forget everything today by the time we meet again. But, you know, that's kind of how sometimes things work. Um, I do want to suggest just one website that if you are sort of looking for answers to things, because inevitably, right, if you mess around with this stuff, there's going to be the situation where you want to do X thing that you can't figure out how to do. And your best bet is to Google it, right, and see if anyone else has figured out how to do that. Or you may want to look at this website. People are always posting questions and people are then answering them. Um, so, so it's a uh, stack exchange. So it's GIS. Yeah. So it's really handy. Um, you then can sometimes see some of the intellectual debates about the best way to do something because people will respond and say, well, that's not the right way. You're supposed to do it this way. 
that's, you know, again, any sort of technology um, project you're going to be dealing with. The fact that you can actually do something probably five different ways, but which is the best of those five ways to do it. And then Google, right, there's a lot of different YouTube videos of varying quality, but it's not bad, right, if you're sort of looking how to do something really specific to see if someone has posted a nice YouTube video. Um, or you can talk to me. Um, I exist. I'm happy to <laughs> chat with anyone. So if you want to email me, um, if you want to call my office, um, I'm here 20 hours a week, so we can try to find a time to sit down and chat and kind of conceptually think through a project, perhaps sort of brainstorm some different programs you could potentially use. Because there's a lot of different ways to go about this type of stuff, right? Another option, if we had more time, would be not even using any kind of mapping platforms and just doing something entirely in Photoshop. So some of the different maps you see designed online are probably not even really made with any ARC or QGIS, but it's playing around in Photoshop. So depending on which route you want to go, you have options. Um, but are there any questions? Concerns? There's a comment, something that you get to fill out, is that correct? There will be an assessment okay. that I will send out to everybody. Okay. <laughs> yes, so there should be an assessment that will be emailed out that if you all could fill out, um, that'd be really helpful. This is the first time I've done this, so any feedback you have um, is appreciated. Um, but otherwise, thanks, everyone. Um, there is a few minutes left, so if you want to hang back and talk with me about anything, I'm happy to do that. Um, yeah, is there anything else, Robert, that I'm forgetting? Oh. Okay, so the recording is going to stop now. All right, thanks, everyone.